I'm Mr. Black, this is Beyond Creepy, and this is the 1960 Durango UFO incident. In the December 28, 1960 edition of the Durango Herald, there is a curious report involving a sighting of a strange object on Christmas Eve. The object was witnessed by more than a dozen people and was investigated by the local police. While this might appeal to those who enjoy compiling such reports, it's the events that followed that proved the most interesting, at least to me. Fortean researcher and author John Keel even wrote a brief summary of the case in his 1984 book, Strange Mutants, though he left out some details which I will cover here. On December 24, 1960, a dozen or so residents living in an outlying area near Durango, Colorado, had a front row seat for something truly anomalous. At around midnight, a light suddenly appeared on the brow of a mountaintop north of the Wade Folsom Ranch. The Folsom family observed the object from the windows of their home. Wade actually wondered if it was the Star of Bethlehem, though all could tell that there was something strange about this star. It was round, and beneath the many small lights there appeared to be tiny windows which blinked. The tall pine trees on the mountaintop stood out in stark relief behind the object, and there was a glow about it. First the glow was white, then green, and then the object disappeared as mysteriously as it had come. Another witness, Ruth Stevenson, recalled, First the sky was bright with hundreds of tiny blinking lights, that seemed to turn around and around and dim to almost nothing, first on one side and then on another, like some giant breathing thing. Then in another moment the object was gone, leaving only the cold night with a bright moon and twinkling stars. Members of the Folsom family, at least a dozen of them saw it, agreed that the top of the object, quote, looked like a giant plastic dome about the size of the family living room, 20 by 25 feet square. Though they debated on whether or not the object actually ever touched the ground or simply remained hovering above it, Wade had a pretty good idea whereabouts in the hills that the object was situated, and so the next day he took his dog and two grandsons and climbed to the top of the mountain. We saw some broken limbs but not much else, Folsom told a reporter with the Durango Herald. To him there was no evidence to indicate that anything had landed there, yet the broken tree limbs puzzled him, he admitted. At around 3 p.m. on Christmas Day, the Stevenson family, many of whom were witness to the strange light on the mountain, were surprised when their pet dog came running at their house, hurling herself at the door. Upon being allowed inside, she ran into the living room, dashed around frantically as though scared by something and then promptly dropped dead. Ruth Stevenson, speaking to the Durango Herald, noted how utterly strange it was since the dog had recently gone missing. For her to suddenly return and then drop dead was both disturbing and confounding. Even more disturbing was the fact that on that very day, a neighbor's dog, which had also gone missing, was observed coming down from the mountain where the strange object had been seen the night before. What was going on? Within the hour, spurred on by the death of her dog, Mrs. Stevenson and three other women decided to go for an impromptu hike up the mountainside in search of anything that might explain the strange happenings. Before departing, they worked out the spot in question. The place where they thought that the object had been was about a half a mile from the road. When they finally arrived at their destination, they examined the area first visited by Wave Bolson and his grandsons earlier in the morning, taking note of their footprints and the broken limbs. They had been up there looking around on this mountain. They didn't see anything really out of the ordinary, and they decided to head back uh, before it got too dark. Um, Mrs. Stevenson had another dog named Coke that had gone with them and he started barking at something in the forest and they got the sense that he wanted them 
to follow him. So they decided because there was still some daylight left and because it was, well, they were already there anyways, they decided to follow him and they followed him up further up the mountain and he stopped at the uh, base of a spruce tree and he was barking at something up in this tree. And they went up to, the, uh, Mrs. Stevenson and the other women went up to this tree and they looked up and they didn't see anything there. But that was when they kind of started looking around and they noticed the tracks in the snow. Bruce Stevenson and her three friends were shocked when they began to examine the snowy ground around them. There were tracks everywhere, leading to the spruce tree and away from it, going in the direction of a clump of cedar trees beyond the clearing. Mrs. Stevenson referred to them as, quote, strange giant tracks, which she and the other women were hesitant to follow just because of their sheer size. They determined that whatever made them must have been huge. As they examined the area, their dog continued to run around and bark excitedly at something, though they could never determine what that something was. Speaking to the Herald, Mrs. Stevenson noted that the large tracks were human-shaped, but it was a set of other tracks which really puzzled the small group of women. Imprinted in the snow was something which resembled a hoof, although there were three hoof marks together in a cloverleaf design. There were many of these tracks leading from the cedar clump, and Mrs. Stevenson noted other broken limbs and bark scraped from the trees about six feet from the ground. The broken limbs, she noticed, had come from the tops of the trees. More indifferent tracks were observed by the women. They resembled deer's tracks, only with four prongs instead of the normal two. These prongs were arranged in a square of about six inches across, but the track itself looked somewhat round in shape. We saw other tracks that looked like some giant frog had leaped from place to place. The pattern of the tracks was in the three attached pointed circles, the tracks possibly some three feet apart, she told the paper. Next, we discovered a strange track that we called the kangaroo. There was the three round footprints with small holes in a round circle and the print of a tail in between. These tracks were about five feet apart, always in a straight line from the clump of trees. There were many of these giant tracks, all leading in different directions, but always in a straight line from the cedar clump. Another set of tracks looked like a footprint of a very small person. The toe was quite pointed, but the foot part was almost round, and there was a small high heel. The print could not have been over five inches long. Stevenson indicated that another set of small footprints was also found by them. It was not as pointed and the heel did not appear to be as high as the other. The four women followed the tracks to a deserted mountain cabin, where the footprints seemed to circle around it before heading back to the clump of cedar trees, or touchdown site as Keel referred to it. After describing these tracks, Mrs. Stevenson said she was familiar with wild animal tracks but was not able to identify the ones found at the mountaintop. It sounds like there was a whole variety of different creatures up there. Uh, I'm just gonna like speculate here. It sounds like there was a couple of small greys. It sounds like there might have been a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch or Sabe or whatever you want to call it. It sounds like there, there might have been some kind of reptile-like creature, uh, frog man or something. And it also sounds like there might have been a kangaroo type creature. And for me, this is interesting because a year ago, I was going to make this video about these weird kangaroo-like entities that people are seeing. That um, if you go through Albert Rosales' guides, his humanoid guides, you will see a large number of stories involving a kangaroo-like entity witnessed by people either near a UFO, a landed UFO, or in the woods. Um, so I thought it was really interesting that that was one of the things that was up there, at least the tracks of it was.
In the same issue of the Durango Herald, reporter Hal Piper attempted to poo-poo the whole affair, speaking to undersheriff Myron Darmar and deputy Bill Heiser, he discovered that they had visited the site that Tuesday, a day after Mrs. Stevenson had examined the area and had observed the strange tracks. Wade Folsom, an apparent skeptic, placed little credence in the tracks because one set was 15 inches long, but, quote, definitely human, as if that was normal. Others, according to Folsom, looked as though someone had turned his fist over and put it in the snow three times close together. Again, something he attempted to pass off as normal. Folsom said he didn't see anything to connect the three-cornered tracks with the object because they weren't near where he had personally seen the object. Folsom further attempted to downplay the tracks by insinuating that the area had been contaminated by locals and therefore unreliable. He claimed that he had personally seen at least 150 cars traveling up the mountain that Tuesday and had been answering calls all day asking about the sighting. Of course, this was hours after Stevenson and her friends had trekked up the mountain and made their observations. From there, Folsom went on to describe in detail the object he and his family saw, while also offering a possible explanation. It was definitely there, a small merry-go-round except that it wasn't revolving. It appeared to be hovering about two or three feet above the ground in a clearing surrounded by small timber, about 400 feet north of Florida Road. But it didn't appear to land, and when I looked the next day, there were no signs that it might have landed. Folsom told Piper that the object appeared to be about 20 feet in diameter. At the top, you could very definitely see a circle or dome, and every foot or so apart were lights. They were evenly spaced and burning like a 100 or 200 watt light bulb. Below the dome were numerous, quote, rectangular curtains, he noted. I wouldn't call them windows because they didn't look like ordinary windows. There were about five or six up and down, and they seemed to revolve, to flop over one row after another. The object remained stationary for about 15 minutes. Then its lights brightened, turned light green, and finally faded out quote, slowly, like a gas flame. After giving Piper the detailed description of what he had seen, a solid craft, Folsom proceeded to explain that he thought it was some type of electrical phenomenon, quote, maybe sun particles striking air, oxygen, and nitrogen, perhaps. He further suggested that it might have been operated by, quote, some sort of magnetic wave in the air, which eventually faded out. It looked to me like magnetic or static electricity, like an aurora borealis. It was the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. Folsom wasn't done. He assailed Ruth Stevenson's interpretation of the death of the dogs, insisting without any apparent evidence that somebody had poisoned them. This did not explain why they had been missing and why they chose that day of all days to return. A curious side note, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, or APRO, in their January 1961 write-up, pointed out that Ruth Stevenson had never indicated that the neighbor's dog had also died, only that it had been missing and was observed coming down from the mountain after the UFO was sighted. It was Folsom who confirmed that indeed both dogs had died on that day, not just Mrs. Stevenson's, which only adds to the mystery. The Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization further added, Folsom's description of the object is strangely at odds with his attempted explanation of its identity, or nature, and his attempt to disregard the tracks seen near the site. Dealing with the death of her beloved pet and the stress of the holidays, Ruth Stevenson declined any further comment on the matter and did not respond to APRO when they attempted to follow up with her. Because of this and Folsom's odd attempts to pass it off as a load of malarkey, possibly to discourage any further discussion on the matter, APRO was hesitant to publish the story, though they ultimately concluded that it was worth it. It appears that a real and rather unusual object was seen, and Folsom's explanation is an attempt to rationalize something which is adverse to his personal inclinations.
Is it possible that on Christmas Eve a UFO landed on a mountainside in Durango, Colorado, something that was witnessed by more than a dozen people? Then a variety of large and small non-human entities exited said craft, walked or hopped around in the snow, checked a cabin, possibly for anyone inside, and then released back to the area some pets that they had previously taken. They then re-entered their craft and departed back to wherever they originally came from. The only thing left behind were some strange footprints in the snow, some broken tree limbs, and two very ill pets. Wade Folsom would probably tell you no, that could not have happened. Ruth Stevenson would most likely tell you yes, that's exactly what happened. Sadly, the truth is probably somewhere in between, and any evidence to be gathered has long since been washed away by rain, covered by foliage, or buried under the ground. Thank you.